Thank you. Such a pleasure to be on a stage in my hometown. I spend more than half the year around the world. Oopsie. And um, it's such a pleasure to be here. So to begin with, here in Cape Town, it's not ever really a problem to encourage people to remember their connection with the ocean. Because we always do. You're driving between the mountain and the ocean, and that's how you know where you are. Because otherwise, who knows how you get from Constantia to Hart Bay, right? <laughs> so I want you to, however, even though we are so close to the sea, and we know our connection to the ocean, I want you to uncross your legs. <laughs> I know, it's starting a bit odd. <laughs> and sit comfortably. Bring your right hand onto your belly and close your eyes and start breathing into your belly so you can feel your belly rise. On the inhale and drop back on the exhale. And take a moment in the next couple of breaths to cast your mind back in your own memory bank and remember a very, very potent memory of yourself in, near, or on water. A good memory. It can be a bath, it can be the first time you saw the ocean, it could be your surf earlier today and spend a few breaths submerged in that memory. And slowly coming back into the room, you can open your eyes. And that's my world, the world of the in and the exhale, and understanding how with every breath we take, we are connected to the ocean. At this very moment, the Amazon forest that is 20% of the oxygen we breathe is burning. At this very moment, we are facing challenges to our ocean that we've never imagined in our lifetime we would see. And more than 50% of the oxygen we breathe comes from the sea. So every second breath you took in your memory was thanks to the ocean. And every tenth was thanks to that burning forest. So we have to remember with every breath we take who we are, what we're connected to, and what it takes to be a human. And so my job for many years was to take a really big breath. And filling up from my stomach to my chest to my shoulders, I would expand my lungs and take the same size breath as the captain of the South African rugby team. And he's built like a refrigerator. <laughs> because of stretching my lungs and allowing for space to breathe in. And so that, as a competitive freediver, is where I spent my time. On one breath, underwater. Freediving is the sport of breathing deeply, slowly, slowing down your heart rate, and then taking one single breath and diving down as deep as you can, as far as you can, or as long as you can. And yes, this is a competitive sport and we break records in it. And when you come up from this dive, you have to look the judge in the face, show an okay sign and say, I'm okay, in that order, and if you don't, you are disqualified. And I was chatting to Kaylee earlier today about what the training involved is. You know, did it help that I used to swim some at school? Does it help that I love water? It's 80% mental. Because the greatest reflex we have is to breathe. From the first breath when we're born to the last breath when we leave, we reflexively breathe. Our bodies are reflexive breathers. You don't have to think about breathing. Even though our previous speaker was one of the most inspiring people I've heard, you didn't suddenly go, Oh my God, I forgot to breathe. <laughs> Your body does it for you. We are reflexive breathers. And so, when you hold your breath, your body asks you to breathe. And that photo on the left is a discipline called constant weight no fins, which means you go as deep as you can, and if you're wearing weights, which the thing around my neck was, to help with the buoyancy of my lungs in the first 10 meters, 
you have to come back up again with that weight. So if you've seen Le Grand Bleu, we're going to sound French later tonight again, you know that they went down with weights in the big blue and came up with an air balloon. The disciplines that fascinated me is what can my body do? How deep can I go on one single breath of air with no assistance? And swimming breaststroke down a rope and back up again, I swam down to 56 meters, which 10 years ago was just a meter from the world record when I was competing. And holding my breath floating face down in the water for over six minutes. When the last three minutes of that breath hold, my body is telling me, you must breathe. And I'm saying, I respect your opinion, <laughs> but I feel that I've got more. And so I lived in this world of having conversations with my body where my body's telling me one thing. And you know, we taught in yoga and all walks of life, listen to your body. And I was like, yes, yeah, sometimes. And sometimes I listen carefully and pay attention to when I really need to act. And when is my body telling me something I don't have to listen to yet? So competitive freediving took me competing around the world, seeing incredible places, but going up and down a line, holding my breath, breaking records. For 10 years, it was about the numbers. And I kept going because I was so fascinated with what my body could do. At one given point, I thought, I'll never get below 40 meters. There was like this glass wall in the ocean for me. And I just thought, I will never get below 40 meters. I changed my diet. I started eating more plant-based, so I became a lot more alkaline. I changed what I drink, no alcohol, no coffee, no sugar, no wheat, no dairy, no meat, all the stuff that you think you want to eat or have at the end of a day. You cut it out and your body becomes alkaline and it becomes this free diving machine and suddenly 50 meters was possible. And then I thought I could never go deeper than 50 meters. And then I started working on my ears, how to equalize, how to cock my head, how to save air in my mouth. And suddenly 60 meters was possible. And so I continued below 60 meters deeper and deeper because your body remembers water. We have an adaptation for being underwater that we share with whales and dolphins and seals. We feel so terrestrial. We walk upright. We breathe air. We smell. We see. And you get into water and your body remembers your inner seal. First thing that happens when your face touches the water is your heart rate slows down. Bradycardia. Second thing that happens, the blood flushes from your arms and legs back up to your core to be redirected to your brain. Vasoconstriction, conserving oxygen. And finally, how many of you have ever consciously thought of your spleen? <laughs> no, I know. It's like a low glory organ. Everybody, you know, we can trade in kidneys, we can mourn the brain and the heart and the this and the that. But your spleen is this lesser known small organ, part of your endocrine system on the left side, and it's stock full of oxygen-rich hemoglobin. It's like a little oxygen warehouse inside of you. And when you hold your breath and your body starts noticing carbon dioxide rising and says, you need to breathe, your body goes, but wait, we have more oxygen. And the spleen constricts to up to half its original size and releases this oxygen-rich hemoglobin into your bloodstream that has been redirected to your brain. We are cousins of dolphins and whales and seals. And these cave fur seals are right here in the harbor. They're all around our coastline. And anytime you get the opportunity to swim with a cave fur seal, you have this realization of just how joyful life can be. With their large puppy dog eyes swir swirling around you. And for me, starting to encounter these animals in the ocean, as I came back from my travels to South Africa, I realized it can't only be about the numbers. More than 70% of the ocean is water. So much of the land has been either explored or destroyed by this time. But in the ocean, there's still magic and there's still pure wilderness. And so I started this passion project with my partner, Peter, who took all these photos you'll see tonight, called The Last Wilderness, of exploring these last wild places, documenting them, sharing them, and supporting their protection. These bottlenose dolphins in Mozambique sped down to the bottom and I was following in this crazy game of dolphin humans circling around each other and to this day I'm not quite sure how Peter got down as quick as he did to get this photo but if you want to talk to him about his swimming career that's how he did it <laughs> and I went on from dolphins 
to trying to find the big, big, big animals in Ecuador, the giant manta rays, the giant whale sharks. And I fell in love with a blue-footed booby bird who doesn't even have blue feet yet because he's a juvenile. And I just realized that this connection with animals, this wilderness I want to explore, exists all around us. My father was a horse breeder. I grew up on a horse farm outside Pretoria. And today he'd be called a horse whisperer. He said it's just good horsemanship. And this interaction with animals became a driving force. This is a tornado of jackfish in Mexico. And you can see me disappearing into it from the surface down to 20 meters, as big as a basketball court of fish. Because the village of fishermen in Cabo Pulmo in the Baja Peninsula in the Sea of Cortez said, we're running out of fish. One man convinced his father, the family convinced the village, the village convinced the Mexican government. And this year they're celebrating 25 years of protection. And it's one of the only places in the world where you can swim into a tornado of fish because the community decided it needs to be protected. This tiger shark is called Emma. Emma lives in the Bahamas. She's a resident certain times of the year on Tiger Beach. Emma is valued at over $10 million in tourism revenue because of people who want to come and swim with her. We've gotten to the point now where it's so dire when we talk about conserving animals that we start valuing them economically, which I think is clever to get something protected, but desperately sad that that's how we have to value our animals. The same as imagining living in a world where every rhino's horn is cut off to save its life. That is not the world we want to live in. And this is not the world we want to live in when things are only valued for their economic contribution. This is a giant manta ray. Up until just over 10 years ago, we thought there was one species of manta, reef mantas. Until the scientists in Mozambique said, why are some of them bigger? Why are some of them behaving more like whales? And started collecting DNA. Turns out there are several species of manta. The third species right now being finalized in DNA sampling. So this is a manta barostris, the giant oceanic manta ray. And she played with us as if she was a mammal, even though she is a very, very large, flat fish. This is a fjord in Sweden, and you'll see that there's no animal here. And I was chatting earlier with Kaylee about what are the, the lessons I've learned from freediving. And apart from only listening to your body sometimes, this is one of my defining moments that led me to make choices differently. So on this day, I was diving for a 60-meter dive with my monofin to break a South African continental record and to try win the championships. And the way it works in freediving is you announce the day before how deep you're going to go. So I said, I'm going to dive 60 tomorrow. So the judges set the rope to 60. You get clicked onto it like a lanyard on my arm that's collected, connected with a carabiner. And so I dive down to the bottom of the rope and then I swim back up again. And that's how you know you've been to the bottom. And the watch on your arm and the tag you bring from the bottom shows that you've done your dive. So on this day, it was about 16 degrees at the surface in the water. At about 10 meters, it was 10. At about 20, it was 5. And down in 60, it's pitch black and it's ice cold. And there's extra ropes running down with lights because you're alone at 60 meters. Those of you scuba dive, you can't put scuba divers down at 60 in black water indefinitely. They'll be stuck on decompression coming up for the next week. You know, you're on your own when you're free diving. This connection to the rope is what keeps you safe and your humility. And so diving down, we put lights on the extra ropes and bright lights at the bottom of the rope. So when you get into the darkness, you can open your eyes, grab the tag and swim back up again. On this day, I took my final breath. I kicked off from the surface, kick, equalize, kick, equalize, kick, Equalize. Those are the only thoughts I'm allowed to think because thoughts cost oxygen. Kick, equalize, kick, equalize, kick, to count 20 kicks, fall, relax. I'm heavy enough, I don't have to kick anymore. Relax, equalize, relax, equalize, relax, equalize. Equalizing the ears because otherwise the air spaces will burst your eardrum. And the deeper you go, the more the pressure builds. And it feels like the ocean is holding you in this giant embrace that's almost a bit too tight. My lungs get compressed beyond their residual volume, so I'm completely compressed. And I feel the bottom of the rope. 
And for me, from the moment I start falling, when I stop kicking, I close my eyes, to be able to just focus, just focus on that equalizing. And as I hit the bottom of the rope, I open my eyes to grab the tag, and I couldn't see anything. And I touched my face, I touched the rope, and I was like, I've gone blind. Something's happened in my optic nerve with the pressure, with something, I don't know, it's so dark, I've gone blind, I'm going to become a statistic, it's something they haven't researched before, just like they never knew about the spleen, they never knew about this blindness, and I concluded, I don't want to live blind. I'm obsessed with beauty, I'm obsessed with these animals, I'm obsessed with exploration. I've had a good run, I'll let go. And I started undoing the carabiner at the bottom of the rope. I'm 60 meters deep, I'm heavy, the fjord's over 100 meters deep, there's currents, I'll just get swept back out to sea. And I start undoing the carabiner, and then I remember my dad's cousin who was born blind, and as a child, getting to know her guide dog, this beautiful black Labrador called Friday. And I thought to myself, I'll get a dog. I'll get a Labrador and we'll have that special bond and I'll still be in this animal interaction world and we'll have, it'll be really special and Labradors love swimming and it'll be fine, I'll get a dog. And I click myself back on the carabiner and I start swimming back up again and I'm considering a black lab, a golden lab, you have chocolate labs, so I'm swimming up, swimming up, swimming up. And I come up to 20 meters and the light starts filtering back and my best friend and safety diver Annelies hanging on the other side of the rope going, what the hell? Because she's been waiting for a minute longer than normally to swim back up with me for my last 20 meters. And then we come up to the surface and I do my surface protocol, mask off, okay sign, I'm okay to the judge. And the organizer leans over the side of the boat and he says, hey, was it dark down there? Because I think we forgot to change the batteries and the torches. Yeah, yeah. Good thing we were in a very pacifist country at the time. And I realized, you don't have to believe everything you think. What a freedom. You don't have to believe everything you think. And in any given time, you have the responsibility to yourself to pick your own story. Gosh, the stories that get spun around us and you know, when I'm lying awake at night sometimes and I listen to my thoughts and I'm like, stop it. I don't want to pick that story. That is not a good thought. Why? What is that? And pick your own story and don't believe everything you think. And so in my very own backyard, we live in a city that is more defined, I think, by its ocean than its mountain and its wine, except that most people don't go there. And we look at it and we just see these weird slimy fronds at the surface. And you get down and there's like a fairy garden of forests and dinosaurs. And this is a seven gill shark that's been around as long as dinosaurs were since then. And in marine protected areas and protected places, these kind of creatures can thrive. And with our support, we can make sure that we can still walk along fossils with only one breath of air. And this isn't in Cape Town. <laughs> this is in Sri Lanka. At the top, you'll see a white squiggle and you'll see two large sperm whales. I got in the water and these two females turned towards me. It was a group of 60 whales. They turned towards me and they started scanning me. Now, a sperm whale have the strongest sonar in the world. The echolocation, the sonar of a sperm whale can knock a giant squid unconscious when they hunt it. So of course I get in the water and I think, please like me. <laughs> I'm your friend. You're so big. You're so beautiful. Thank you for letting me be here. And they scanned me. And then they turned and looked at me with that crinkled giant eye making eye contact when you know, like you know, like you know, that somebody's home. Somebody very, very intelligent is looking back at me. And as one, these whales took their breath, dived down, and disappeared down to three kilometers is the trench where they're hunting the giant squid. And I swam down with them for about 30 meters, and then I was like, oh, I can't go where you go. No training in the world will get me there. And with this sense of 
bereftness, I watched them disappear. And then I saw this small gray shape coming out of the blue water. And a young baby sperm whale came up to me, touched its head to me, and started circling. And I have read that when these giant groups of sperm whales dive, if there's a baby too young to go with them, they leave it at the surface with a young female, a babysitter, whale, normally. <laughs> On this day, all the adults dived, and for 45 minutes while they hunted, I babysat. Well, I didn't. I didn't know how to babysat it instead of whale. I played with a baby whale. And she swam circles around me, and then I would have to go up and breathe, and she'd be like, what? Again? You're pathetic. <laughs> like, I know. And then I'd go down again and swim circles and swim circles. And I just became infused with this knowledge that we live on a shared planet. It is not the human planet. It's even arrogant to see ourselves as the custodians in the biblical sense. We need to spend so much more time considering how this is a shared planet and how our actions, even though when you're in the water with a sperm whale, trust me, you feel very small. The minute you're back on land, again, as a species, we are giants. We hold the well-being of every giant creature in our hands. It's remarkable how we've developed to be in that position. And for me, <laughs> how can you love something so deeply and not want to be involved in it? and not want to protect it. For me, the greatest impetus is love. Not fear, not statistics, not facts. It's when we feel. It's when we feel connected and we understand that connection. And so building on the East as of protect what you love, when I moved back to South Africa, I was like, well, what I love is my country. What I love is the ocean. And what I love is people reaching their potential. And that was the start of creating meaning for me, true meaning in what I want to be doing with my life. And that was the birth of the I Am Water Foundation, nine years ago in 2010. Next year is going to be a big party. I'm going to invite your mom. <laughs> Ten years of sharing ocean experiences with kids along our coastline and other places in the world who for so many heartbreaking reasons don't have access to what is right there. Through our political past, through sometimes but not often cultural, through generations of fear, we have children living walking distance from the sea and have never seen what's in there. And with I Am Water, we're working directly with schools, bringing the kids directly to the beach and sharing with them what's in their ocean. Conservation message, ecology message. And we've worked with over 1,700 kids this last year. And this coming year, we're counting on over 3,000. And it is exciting work. Every time a child... <laughs> Every time a child opens their eyes underwater, magic happens. It's not just a privilege, it's a human right to have access to nature. And it's something we South Africans need to work much, much harder at, at achieving. And so the little video I want to share with you to finish off with is a young girl called Simam Kele who lives in Red Hill, you'll recognize the area. From her house, she can see the ocean. And we got the chance of working with her last year. And in her own words, this is her story. Why do they say the sea is no place for me when it looks big enough to fit the world? why they call it a rich man's paradise. No place for the likes of you and me. They say there's monsters to drag me into the deep. Me. 
it says, don't fear. I am everything I dreamt I would be. And Sima's story is one of many, many, many young South Africans. And when we work with kids, groups are 35, when we run double workshops on different beaches, up to 70 kids at a time. And what makes it possible for us is that over 70 coaches we've trained who come from these communities who have a passion for sharing their love of the ocean with others. So when we're talking about entrepreneurship, which we are here tonight, I also encourage you, if you're in a position in your life where you're wondering which direction you want to go in, you can do good and do well. They are not mutually exclusive. We employ over 30 of these coaches as freelancers to come and work with us to host these workshops. And they make a very, very good living. And that's one of the things we're proudest of, is that we can create opportunity and do the nonprofit work. That it's not just based on volunteers who fly in and come and do it and then disappear. And so we're very proud of our coaching community who've become a force for good in their own neighborhoods where they live. And such a shout out to all of them. I love them from the bottom of my heart. And when you remind, surround yourself with like-minded people, then all these challenges we face, when you turn on the news, when you open your BBC feed, when you open anything today, it's so easy to get so despondent, depressed, and lose hope. But things are what we call them. And if we say that there is no more hope, then there isn't. And so I prefer to live in a reality where I know that love opens hearts, and I know that there is hope. So I hope to see you all in the water. Thank you.